This is the data from um, our intravenous immunoglobulin study, which was done quite a long in the 90s. And what we did, we took, we said anyone that had any chronic changes on their valves, you weren't be, weren't eligible. So what that meant was, and there was obviously any any past history, they were excluded. So as best we could, we had 32 patients in the control group who didn't get anything, and we wanted to look at, and, and well, the point is here that at presentation. Um, half of them, over half, had carditis, um, but but the natural history, because these people didn't have any any um, treatment, obviously, and even the gap and the gamma level we know didn't work. I could have put them all in here. The point is that severe stayed severe, moderate stayed moderate, but by and large, a lot of the milds and the subclinicals get better. And some get some got worse, but the majority, and this this fact is often not. Um, um, so the first thing is that the true, the true first episode, you don't usually get severe carditis, okay? Um, and also, there's an improvement within a year. Again, this is all old data from the 50s and 60s, but it needs to be reiterated to, you know, you trainees like Warren that are just starting off and roaming people. Um, and so it's it's all old data. It's been down there for years. Okay, and when you, you know when you get a, someone coming in with acute rheumatic fever. It's a continuum. Their carditis may be about to get worse, or maybe about to get better. You don't know where they are on the on the scale. And we've looked at this again. Um, this was with Doppler from the late 80s, and this was with color Doppler. So that, but how? It, so this is where we, our algorithm. We say that we like to admit them for a couple of weeks because even if you haven't got carditis, because at two weeks, you, maybe four. But if there's going to be any carditis develop by by listening or by also by echo, it'll be there within within two to four weeks and just about the guidelines you know this is the white stuff is the AHA and you know it's just so old-fashioned um, you know whatever you're hearing and whatever you use you're going to echo is going to be the standard I don't know how many patients I've seen with arthritis where the pediatrician or the pediatric registrar has said murmur mitral regurgitation I mean they're more likely to be wrong than right and so you echo stops the <laughs> stops um, the diagnosis of mitral regurgitation. Sometimes, of course, it stops penicillin because they actually haven't got rheumatic fever. Um, so that that this is quite interesting. I, I've got a whole talk on this. Is that when you've got beyond first degree heart block, you know, when you get secondary block and sometimes third degree block, I don't think there's any other viral or bacterial illness that does that. So when we see dropping the P waves and you just see the usually in a, a junctional rhythm at the same rate as the, um, the the sinus rate and then a few days later they'll go back into or they'll go in and out of it and it's just 
we, we, were, we didn't put it as a major criterion, but we, uh, I think the next time, <laughs> 10 years' time, that, that should be because um, one of my mates at Middlemore, Ross Nicholson, we haven't come up in discussions much, but he, he, he thinks he sees that about 10%, but I just can't get him to publish the stuff about it. Um, okay, go on to some echo. So this is the left atrium. So what we've got here is the um, anterior leaflet just billowing back into the left atrium. Okay. The, so look at the posterior leaflet. What do you think of that? Any any takers for the posterior leaflet? What do we think of the posterior leaflet? So this one is. Um, that anterior leaflet is also bowing back, but it's more sort of the mid body, isn't it? Yes. Uh, rather than the um, the, m the posterior leaflet's moving very nicely. We put some colour on. So what we see with the colour is there's that bowing anterior leaflet, and so we know that it's prolapsing behind the posterior leaflet, confirmed by colour. So the jet, the the classical jet of an anterior valve prolapse is directed posteriorly and leftward and then it goes up into the pulmonary veins now one of the important points is that our eye I mean what determines the severity now I've called that moderate but we look at the proximal jet width and the length and the area and there was a lot of data about proximal jet width being more important because if you think about it you've got an orifice that's that's it's closes and that um, it's going to be the diameter of that of that circle or the, the ovoid shape that's actually going to allow how much blood's going to come back so in this case the jet is hitting the left atrial, the lateral wall and then the energy dissipates so say it hit there and then disappeared and we can see it here going right back onto that left pulmonary vein but um, so it's it could be severe it could, it's at least at least moderate could be severe Okay, just changing topic slightly to um, morphological features. So here's a, um, what, is this valve going to be stenotic or regurgitant? From, we've got a thickened tip and we've also got restricted motion of that tip. So it opens, the whole leaflet opens quite nicely but the, the little tip is, is, is held. The tip is um, thickened but it's also um, you know, a bit of mobile, isn't it? And then if you look at when it closes, we've got a little gap there. I don't want to touch them. Um, we've got a little gap. So we're going to have a bit of regurgitation. But with time, if that person doesn't go into a very severe regurgitation, this valve will become stenotic. But it might take a decade. Um, that's n that valve is overall is not going to be stenotic now. But this is really what we call a dog leg. So if you saw that on screening, this, I mean, there's, I can't, there's no other illness that really gives you that sort of we can say, you know, tick this, the, the chances of this being, probability of this being rheumatic is so high that that I think everywhere around the world would agree that this is a rheumatic, like to be rheumatic. And here we go. Here, so there's the, it's directed posteriorly. And this is probably sort of mild or, or moderate. Um, so certainly generous mild. We look at that proximal jet width and it's actually quite broad isn't it? It's, you know it's a few millimetres whereas most of you, what you're going to call mild the proximal jet width is quite short. It's quite quite narrow if it's on that. So uh, certainly in our lab we don't we describe it rather than use normals. We use normals for just Z scores you know confidence limits for body surface area but the one thing we don't use is the left atrium. Um, on this side this was the original diameter that was used and it's a very good question. Now this is a view that's so underutilized. I mean, it's just st standard parasternal short axis imaging. And yet, the number of times I see studies, both in, the, in any setting, evaluating a mitral leaflet where they've done nice apical views, nice parasternal long axis views, but haven't done a nice sweep. See how we're sweeping there from the left ventricular outflow tract down through, it, see that bit of movement there? But as you come down, you'll pick up these jets. So here's a valve that's got, this is, with, you know, um, two jets from both the commissures. And so again, so if you saw that on the, we're now saying, well, that both those jets are probably at least a good mild, and we probably are going to call this a moderate jet. 
again, if we go back to overlapping what he's going to be talking about to the minor end, you can get physiologically a bit of, you know, tiny bit of MR, which is true regurgitation and have two jets, but it's very, very rare. Most physiological MR is just one jet. So again, it's not telling you it's rheumatic, but it's telling you it's a likely a pathological etiology. And central. Um, but yeah, and central in this view and central in the other view. Absolutely right. So here's another, this is I think the same patient, and um, we've got um, this jet going into the left atrium. So when we do the pulmonary ve ve venous, you'll hear about pulmonary venous um, interrogation, you don't, and normally you have a continuous flow, a bit of, bit of systole and a bit of diastole coming into the, into the, um, uh, the pulmonary veins. But we do it away from the jet because the jet itself has got a mechanical change to that to that jet, so we we assess them in the in the vein, which is usually the right upper, away from the from the. Um. Now, uh, having said that, first episodes don't usually have severe carditis. They don't, but there's one exception. So here's a kid that arrives in Briar Pete's Ross Nicholson's area in Middlemore. So the kid has got pneumonia, isn't he? The pediatrician said it was pneumonia, the, the ED physician said it was pneumonia. This kid has three day history, he was playing rugby league, two days um, nose, a slightly sore, he did have a slightly sore joint, but whether he did or didn't really matter. He, ca he gets breathless, the GP quite right, gives them antibiotics, bit of, bit of uh, prednisone, <laughs> and then, then he comes in the middle of the night and he's completely out of breath, he's got crackles all through his lungs, but paediatricians just, just don't recognise pulmonary edema. It's just not on, it's just not on their um, armamentarium of diagnoses. So, but we had a registrar had just been working with us. Um, so that's actually pulmonary edema, but that was what the, the diagnosis was. And look at this. What's going on? Is it anterior or posterior prolapse? So I looked at that. This was a Saturday morning. This kid comes in. We just finished our ward round. But what else, but what else besides the posterior prolapse? What's the other feature about that? This is severe MR. I'll show you the colour. Here's the colour in the long axis. It's just torrential. Look at, the, look at that posterior leaflet. It's the, so dramatic. So what's the difference from this than all the pictures that Warren I've shown already with the size of the left atrium? There's no left atrial dilatation. There's no left atrial dilatation. So this, he went to surgery. And so this has um, been described by the South Africans. Uh, and we had four cases in about 18 months with this that were needed surgery within 24, 48 hours. There's a surgeon in this country, a fantastic surgeon, who works in Vietnam. He goes out to them, visits there. He's a brilliant valve repairs, but he's never seen, he says it doesn't exist. But he hasn't, because he doesn't work in the acute setting. So there's almost certainly about 1% of, of, if you look at the various studies, of a the true first episode that end up in pulmonary edema are called pneumonia and just peter out. Quite fascinating. So we've actually just put these cases together. It's come out in general paediatrics. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Kirsten spent the whole day doing it, and my biggest problem was working out was that anterior leaflet bulging or not. In the end, she so she repaired the posterior. She put artificial cords, um, uh, and then we did a, I did a TOE and it was the anterior was just billowing back but she said it was so hard to tell the plane there was no real plane of the, of the whole annulus so then she went back on repair shortened the stretched they weren't ruptured the other ones were ruptured the posterior ones the stretched ones and then got this beautiful repair with no with no um so it, it, it's just something to, to be aware of so we use echo certainly in acute emr acute rheumatic fever it's very helpful to triage those those ones that have got complete mechanical disruption. Any good clinician, a good physician, let alone a cardiologist, should be after you've got isolated mitral regurgitation at the bedside, greater, mild, moderate, severe. You know, it's it's that's including an ECG and X-ray. I think we can all do that. That's standard ability. But you get MR and AR, and then throw in TR, and it's very difficult. Then it starts getting really difficult. What's what's the dominant lesion? Um, and that again, just just emphasising echo. Okay, we'll go on to aortics. He's a 12-year-old boy. Okay, so he's he's 48 kilograms, 
body surface is at 1.44 meters squared. He's got an auto annulus of plus seven, so it's very dilated, this annulus. But I think we agree that.